Hey everybody, this is Conrad Agramont, CEO here at Agile IT. Thanks for joining us for another Agile IT Tech Talk. Uh, today we're going into a you know pretty specific sub subject around what's new in uh, Hyper-V 2019. There's a ton of stuff that's in here. So with uh, with the Tech Talk format, we like to just go through about 10 or 15 minutes of some you know some, some interesting subject area. So we're only going to cover a few areas as we go through here today. Joining me once again is Miguel Escalante, who's one of our uh, senior engineers here at Agile IT. And we're gonna talk really around two specific areas. Um, now, what well, the good thing is about when we talk about this around Hyper-V, um, that's gonna be the context, but actually applies to a lot of things within uh, within the uh, Windows Server 2019 uh, environment. So these are the really two that we're gonna go through. As always, if you have any questions, please post them uh, in here so we can follow up with it uh, towards the end or we'll open the phone lines if you join us online. Uh, again, this is one of the benefits that we have with our customers for both uh, managed services, security as a service, as well as those that do their licensing through us uh, here at Agile IT. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, jump away. So, um, you know, one of the interesting things is there's this is uh, Windows Admin Center, which is, you know, something that's been kind of in the news, if you're in the kind of that tech news, if you will, uh, around Microsoft providing a, a web-based version for server administration. There's been other attempts that Microsoft's had to do this in different areas, but you know now it's you're really starting to th see these things come together. And maybe we'll nerd out on uh, on that a little bit later as I as we can talk about how it kind of evolved. But for now, um, Miguel, why don't you go and tell us a little bit about um, just you know the architecture and deployment of, of it? Sure. Uh, so main point here is like Conrad mentioned is uh, Microsoft's tried multiple iterations to come up with a unified management tool for one or many servers. Most sysadmins would like to go to that single pane of glass um, solution where they can see everything um, you know, from, from a single uh, screen. I think that this is finally an attempt that they're gonna be successful with. They've tried multiple things. You know, The Microsoft Management Console has been around forever. It's still used by many sysadmins. I think it's pretty much the tool of choice. This, however, changes the, the ball game a little bit because it actually installs an on-premise gateway that is then, then allows that gateway to connect to the servers. And then once you're connected to those servers with a cache set of credentials, you can execute management tasks on them. The difference here is that it also allows you to do not only actions on a server, so you don't have to go to one server and then another and then another, but it aggregates in, in more of a um, overall view, so then you can navigate from one starting point to another server or another cluster, or in, if you have it configured as well for, you know, just a, a, a right. workstation. And we'll show some screenshots of, of some of those. But what I found that's interesting here is that it's all browser-based, and this one top area here where, you know, where there's so much investment around Azure, you don't need Azure to do this. You don't even need internet connectivity to do this, right? You can do this in your own corporate environment if you need it secure or just want to be able to access it locally and still get these benefits uh, and not have to remote desktop into each one of these servers to do kind of key activities. It's nice to have this well, facility to do it. The other thing is focused around user experience, right? The experience is similar to Azure where, where it's blade consistent. The navigation goes you know, from left to right. Uh, the other interesting thing here to note is that the management of itself is done through using PowerShell. Mm -hmm. So anything you can do in PowerShell, you can use a custom component or plugin to admin center to be able to achieve using that GUI that's provided there. And also, again, you know, you can do this using any modern browser like Edge or Chrome. Uh, Internet Explorer doesn't work that well with it, but at least those what? two are for How sure dare you say IE is not not the greatest? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but what's also really good here is kind of this middle, right? This is a classic um, IT architecture layout, right? You know, user act, client up top, kind of reaching down in. The other thing that's nice is that, you know, you if you want to access it from the Internet, you can. It's not required. If you want to access it on-prem, but you also get this buffer so you can still have people log in securely, right? Everybody does SSL, so you can log in securely, get access to this portal, which you'll see here in a second, uh, and then be able to access a variety of, of a variety of areas. It's, it's especially helpful if you have um, a group of admins that are, you know, not in a data center all the time and you have an after hours emergency. Mm -hmm. They have the capability of being able to do some administrative tasks just using their mobile phone, 
because right. it's all HTML5 based. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing here that you get the uh, capability of doing is you can actually prepare the servers remotely if you're going to install another application or some other capability remotely. You don't need to remote desktop into the server, go launch server manager, and then add the roles. You can just do this using that simple GUI, and that saves you at least log on, log off time to be able to prepare the server for certain things. Right. So this is this is key. So this is a view into it, and we'll you know as we're talking about Hyper V for now. So in, in general, this is available for lots of things. Um, but yeah, as we're talking about Hyper V specifically, let's say I had a, a host out there and I did want to enable it. I used to have to either you know what most IT admins will do log you know log into that server, remote desktop into it. Go through the navigation, click, 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 and go through that. Um, and maybe, maybe have to do that a number of ways. The other way, which is great, which is PowerShell, which we like to do here at Agile IT. Uh, but maybe you're just not up to snuff, and you're kind of you only have two options. Now you have this third, where you can go ahead and do that configuration here. Um, again, you see you see it here for Hyper-V, but you can also see some areas on the left. We'll talk about that in a few of other areas that's specific to a given server to 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 manage, or here on the right for roles and features to be able to turn them on turn them off, reboot it, and perform those functions. And the other reason why you might want that is this server that got deployed might be running the core version, so there is no GUI, right? And you might think, like, oh, goodness, now I have to install the admin tools on my desktop, then I have to run as and connect to it and perform it. Instead, just use that, you know, the admin center, add it as an available server, and still use a very GUI version, but without remote desktoping, right? So it's kind of nice to have that ability to, to, to manage in a different way. Uh, so for, but for this, you know, scenario, I have a box, let's say server core, and I want to turn on Hyper-V for it. Using the admin center, I'm able to do that, right? Um, and then when we get to this, now you can actually um, manage that server. So once you got deployed, it reboots. Right, you can do the, the the things here. You can actually manage the individual facets of the VM Hyper-V machine here. You can see here it gives you a summary of how many machines are running, how many machines are off, total, you know, pause in those main categories. It also tells you resource utilization. You know, hey, you have 82% of your memory uh, used out of four gigabytes. You know, you may have all the CPU in the world on this machine, but if you don't have memory, they're not going to start. So it's good for diagnostics that Hyper-V doesn't give you this dashboard look out off the gate. Uh, it allows you to enhance it a little bit more as far as also surfacing events directly related to Hyper-V mm -hmm. um, without having to go, you know, open up a console, go to the event log, and then open up a console and go to Hyper-V. So it really is a, an aggregate of multiple sources of information that will really allow you to, you know, be more productive because you don't have to be going to, to 10 different places to pull the information from. Right. As you can also see here, it uh, depending on the features that are enabled on the server, this one example shows storage replica and storage. Uh, you can also manage scheduled tasks and, and things like that from this from this one screen. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty powerful in regards to you know the capabilities you can do. Um, if we had a, it, this screen doesn't show it, but if you actually did have virtual machines on there, you can actually go to the console of each one without needing to install any third agent on it. It does it using um, Direct Connect. Um, RPC right. for remote management. So a couple little sneaky things in, in here that I think are kind of interesting. One, if you look at the URL, so this is localhost, but I'll see you're connected to one of the other servers. Um, if you're looking at this host, right, and you're like, oh, look at these virtual machines in space, I can select the URL that's here, right, so you can see that it's context specific. I can, you know, go into Teams, which we all love here at Agile IT, go into Teams, go, hey, check out you know, the amount of space that we have on the server, click on the link and you'll see it. Where before I had text like, hey, can you log on to the server and take a look at it? So they'd have to remote desktop in, go in, what was the server? They, now they just click on it and, and, now, and now have it. This same information was available, but yeah, you'd have to remote desktop into the box or if you, you, know, if you were mature enough to have you know, the, the performance monitor your computer and link them all together, but now again, you're one by one linking apps. Th this makes it much, much simpler. Anyway, so this is the power that you have here to, to look at what your virtual machines are, it's, it's consumption and usage. Uh, taking a step back at, at once you actually get into Admin Center, um, you know, the first one is the place where you install it, but then you can add those additional servers. So these things on the left um, are additional servers that let's say we just added in that are other Hyper-V servers or the virtual machines 
that are running on that Hyper-V server. And I can see them all here again, making it very easy to then navigate in my environment. This doesn't replace something like, you know, SCCM, right? If you're doing like really large deployments, but it is a good kind of augmented tool for smaller deployments. I would say, you know, 25 to 30 and under. Um, and and these things can be servers that are in Azure, they can be on-prem, right? It really doesn't care, it just has to be able to connect to it, you know, directly. Um, Right. Uh, the next thing is especially geared more, like you mentioned, towards smaller, um, small size businesses. Maybe, you know, a couple of uh, branch locations that they want to have a single management point for this. Um, they may also have a, you know, site site tunnel up to Azure, and they want to do this. And they want to have the capability of being able to do it remote. Um, if you have a machine running on Azure, you'll notice that a lot of the capability that you have there is to restart the machine just from going to the blade, the control blade, and hitting restart. This gives you the same capability, you know, with on-premises machines. Right. That was very, very cool. It's also nice to see who's logged in and was, and was managing it um, in that environment. So this is another view. This is sort of if you if you look at the Azure experience as far as performance graphs goes, it's sort of similar. It tells you the same facets. Uh, it gives you a CPU profile, gives you a memory profile, gives you an Ethernet usage, and finally gives you a disk usage. Uh, and their performance metrics, you know, what it's committed, how much it's cached, things like that. This is especially helpful with troubleshooting performance that you don't have enabled. It's rare when someone has Perfmon enabled on a box. They usually do when they suspect the problem. This will allow them to, you know, do that. Now, one of the things here that's interesting, and I'm not sure if they're going to take care of it in future releases, is it just tells you real time from about a minute ago. So, you know, I'm not sure if they're, you're going to be able to, you're probably going to be able to increase the, you know, the time window in future releases. But for now, it just tells you that specific 60 seconds ago point in time, real time scrolling of performance metric. You, you know, I always find that something like this is interesting is um, let's say a box is not performing well and you're like, well, let me go check it out. What do you normally do? Like you log into the box. Well, it's already not performing well. And then once you've logged in, you're actually taking more memory space. And then when you try to do diagnostics or whatever, you're actually taking more processing space too. So the nice thing about this, you can quickly take a look at what's happening on that box without interfering with the box by logging in or connecting in and, and, and seeing this information. Now, the coolest thing about this is if you have the virtual machine added to admin center, and if you have the host added to admin center, you can easily open up a tab, look at the performance of the host, open up another tab, look at the performance of the guest OS, and be able to correlate the two or see if there's any relationship between, well, CPU is spiking at this particular time, guests spiking at this particular time. Is there any correlation between those? So it really gives you a lot of capability versus, you know, it's, it's a 10-minute task always to just log into the server. By the time your desktop gets rendered, you open up your tools, you're 10 minutes into it. This really allows you that instantaneous, you know, side by side, especially if you're leveraging, you know, like a widescreen monitor, you can really see them. I do love my widescreen. <laughs> nice. Um, For clusters, it's uh, the same. You can really get the 10,000 foot overview of everything that you want with the cluster. Any alerts that's uh, in the cluster event log is critical, get surfaced here. So you don't need to go to another, yet another location to look for them. Gives you the health overall, capacity, storage utilization. This is especially helpful when you're doing, you know, hyperconverged or storage spaces direct type of deals. Uh, it tells you also the switches that are on the server and the amount, you know, servers that are there. A lot of information, again, just summarized up in a very organized manner so you don't have to go to 20 different locations. Again. Right. Yeah, I think the other thing that's important when looking at this from a cluster perspective is... You know, again, there's there's kind of the big daddy product of System Center, right? Operations management, configuration management, virtual machine manager, and they're still there, and they do a lot of great stuff. That's that's even way beyond this. But a lot of times, when you have you know a couple of smaller clusters, some VMs, even though you may say you know quote unquote to Microsoft size of a small business, you could still you know in the, in that category have a thousand people with. 40 servers, right, or 30 servers, and some of them are a line of business applications, and you're not really ready or require that amount. Using something like this gives you exposure to all the things that the Windows infrastructure can do, what Hyper-V can do, without having to purchase like the bigger 
products to organize it because that's a that's a huge ordeal to go do so it gives you that nice progression so you know i don't want to minimize when we look at this and go it's a small business like no it's not small business three servers this is good for like you know a much larger footprint and complexity that you can support and as far as the ops manager and configuration manager suite you also need someone to run it yeah because it's not just setting and forgetting most people set up their environment you know it's great it's working it allows them to achieve a certain goal that they had set out to do uh, and then what happens? Well, then you need to update it. You need to maintain it because, you know, it, it just things get updated, things change, the environment changes. So it's over to hell so to keep up with that. Hey, that's what we do. <laughs> uh, the deployment here actually gives you a couple of different options. The easiest one is just putting on your Windows 10 desktop if you're connected. Very small environment. Uh, like Conrad mentioned, maybe you have if your entire office is one office and you just have one admin and that's fine or maybe you have in a data center that's fine too a uh, dedicated gateway server is more if you're doing a particular environment that has you know a mixture of servers and workstations and you're probably amongst the 50 to 100 nodes probably a little bit more managed node um if you're actually going to be this is the deployment that you would see within a cluster so you would probably have a dedicated gateway server and then the managed node solution would be for integrating into a cluster because it needs to be inside that particular environment you can do it standalone to just manage that one cluster if you want or if you want to do it to you know all the machines you would pick a gateway server yeah i also think it's important to note that you know the the gateway server service right it's it's I think it's more kind of conceptual to some degree, but you know, those are those would really be the two main routes you you really have would have to take if you want to access this thing via the internet, right. right? So you say, hey, I want to be able to to access those things without remote desktoping, no matter where I am as an administrator, put an SSR cert on it, certify it. But there's always this buffer, so I'm not putting like if I was doing a managed node where I have to make that server available for the internet. Like you don't want to do that. So you, you, you know, so definitely those you know, the dedicated second one and the one all the way to the right, the gateway service that you'd want to expose to do on things on the internet. And if it is a very complex, important thing, because maybe what you're managing is a line of business application, then you can't have that server go down to manage it because it's maybe rebooting for an update or something, then you'd probably want to load balance it or put it across a collection of boxes. Uh, then you have the third op, the, the fourth option really is the high available, high available gateway service, basically, leverages windows clustering use a shared disk for quorum it basically goes out and, and makes itself all available if one node needs to be taken down for maintenance roles are transferred to another within seconds so you may be on the website and they give you a you know an error next time you refresh either it's there if it has you know you're talking about load balancing boxes well load balancing and also high availability so it actually is able to transfer services between them and it talks to a single database so mm -hmm. The, 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 it's it's available mm. even if if one goes down the other one's up it's an active passive configuration mm. okay cool all right and what's also interesting here is with this what you can manage but let, let's kind of move forward because the other thing we want to talk about real quick is just the the kind of the updates to the resilient file system and and you know what it's able to provide especially in a hyper v or really in the infrastructure but again hyper v specific Right, so REFS was uh, first introduced 2012 R2, so three releases ago. Now that it's 2019, it's been through its, you know, it's been performance tested, you know, quite a bit, especially when they released on 2016 Storage Spaces Direct with all the clustering stuff that Microsoft now is doing a play on SANS. Uh, it's really gotten very good at storage, so the next evolution would be just to perfect their REFS system, which is the next evolution of NTFS. The big thing here, uh, the big feature that was missing on both prior iterations of this was data deduplication. Usually when you have data, the data that you have in your network, if you're running virtual machines, you can see a lot of performance enhancements as far as storage usage because these machines, all, all of them have an operating system. More than likely, they're going to be the same version of the operating system. More likely, they're going to be at the same patch level. So you're going to see a lot of stuff that's you know, repetitive across all these, you know, VHDXs, and data duplication allows you to do basically that: Un remove the duplicate data and run off of a single single replica, a single master set parent, 
and then any variation would be, you know, the this would be the the, the successor to parent children discs, in in a sense. Mm. And also, you know, allows you to save on files and then and, and other types of files uh, system identities. It also has grown as far as scale goes. You used to be able to just do to 32 gig 32 volumes. Now you can do 64 volumes, 64 terabytes. So you can see it's almost quadruple or double across, you know, every um, particular aspect of storage as devices keep growing. Because right now, finding a one terabyte disk is quite common, maybe mm -hmm. not so much, you know, four years ago. But it, but but there's really two things here, right? It is saying that 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 within Windows, it itself can manage a large amount of storage. At the same time, it can make the best use of that storage because of data duplication. It just knows that hey, there's a piece of file or information you want, and that I'm going to write, and I recognize that I've already written that, so I'll just put a pointer to it. If it changes, then I create another version of it. So. I can put more space, but make better use of that space. So it's not like I just have to keep adding more and more. And because even though I have 15 copies of the same thing, it's like, well, you are going to grow, but grow a little bit, a little bit smarter. So that's uh, that's always interesting um, that they're making those increases there, especially in total capacity for clusters and servers, as the environment tends to continue to to to, to consolidate for virtual machines or storage, even though. There's still a lot of people like we take customers that go to Azure, but there might be some things you may still have on-prem for a certain line of business application. Maybe there's some IoT stuff that you're doing. Maybe there's some on-prem or or SQL applications that require it, large files that you don't want to go to the cloud. So there's always kind of good reasons, if you will, very specific why you need to continue this kind of storage on-prem. But what's also interesting is that Windows Server 2910 with this type of storage isn't just for on-prem. You can also do these same things in Azure where you might have even more access to, to storage. Um, like, how am I going to get a petabyte? You know, I got to buy all these servers. No, you just link them up in Azure and use it at, at will. Well, and then it's a good point you brought up. They do they do keep bringing in the point home of develop for a single experience. It's the same thing if you do it in Azure. It's the same thing if you do it on-prem. The provisioning may be different a little bit on how you get to the machine running, but once you do inside the machine, you do the same things the same way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a consistent experience. Uh, this is just reference architecture as far as uh, running SMB3 using, you know, storage spaces direct or scale out file system, which is the recommended architecture for running virtual machines with dedicated storage nodes, dedicated compute nodes, or, or hyperconverged. Really, the the main draw there is that blue line where it says cluster shared REFS volumes or cluster shared volumes. One side of the spectrum would be the newer architecture. The other side, the left side would be the newer architecture. The right side, as you can see there, the tiers are equivalent, would be 2016 and below. Uh, leveraging storage space direct, running all these storage servers in the background, going through the storage bus, and finally accessing local hard disk drive and SSD for storage caching. So this would be a most efficient way of running, you know, virtual machines then providing shares and then having your Hyper-V servers that have a lot more memory, a lot more CPU than the other uh, devices that provide the storage run your VMs. So this is a way of capitalizing even more on that, especially when you get, also get the duplication because your storage goes, you know, that much more bang for the buck. Right. So now you have these newer capabilities of storage, some of the newer things in Windows are in uh, Hyper-V and, and Windows that, you know, there's still more to talk about in a future session. But... You look at all these pieces, and it's nice to also know that now you have, you know, the the new ad, Windows Admin Center in order to then pull all that together and manage it as uh, as one unit. So, uh, you know, one last thing to kind of talk about here in terms of architecture, although we don't have a slide on this, which you know I'm sure nobody's you know going to cry over, but uh, you know, is really encryption. So the other nice thing in Windows Server uh, 2019, as it relates to Hyper-V 2019, is really to, to encrypt traffic, network traffic. Um, not just between VMs, but between VM hosts, right? And and at first you look at it like, well, why do I need to need to do that? Um, but there might be some requirements, like I, you know, in a previous role when you know we were doing things in the uh, the life science space, um, uh, where you might have to do some, uh, uh, you're doing some preclinical work, clinical work, some early early discovery work, and you're thinking, well, some of that data we're collecting, um, we want to virtualize it, but you know, we're kind of 
kind of concern that within the, the machine itself or between that somebody could still tap that connection, right? And, and see the network traffic as you would. Um, so now within server 2019, there's something that allows you to kind of solve that problem. Right. Um, it's basically encrypted network traffic. Um, it allows you to do that from hypervisor to hypervisor. It allows that abstraction of the network, even if you don't want to put IPsec between the tunnels. Um, if you have multi, if you have multiple tenants within a, a, a Hyper-V host, they still won't be able to see the network. It's mm. it's transparent to them. It's set up from adapter to adapter level, and it basically allows you to leverage that uh, encryption capability to right. provide so, more security. So the teams that have their apps in there don't have to think about the encryption. You could just set that up. But there is some work on the IT side to make sure that the certificates have been set up on the different hosts and they configure them, make sure they're in the same subnet. But now you can you can validate like, hey, you guys are in yeah these three physical hosts and 18 different virtual machines, but all your crazy stuff going on, you're on your own kind of network private environment, right? Without having to retool your whole thing, which is even more secure than if they were running physical on prem, right? Yeah, because so, I can just type well, in. Virtual is better. <laughs> I love those. Virtual is better and cloud is even better. But uh, cool. I think those are all the things we wanted, we wanted to really talk to today, really about the admin center and kind of encourage people to take a look at that. If you're one of our customers and you want us to, to kind of uh, review that with you, if we haven't already deployed that for you um, or going even deeper, we certainly love the opportunity to do that. So um, that being said, let's see if, uh, see if we want to open up the lines or any questions.